Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today in our webinar, Preparing for a Brave New World, the Centralized Partnership Audit Regime. I'm Bill Schmaltzel, a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. I'm a member of our tax controversy group where I represent clients in all stages of tax litigation, including audits, administrative proceedings, and United States Tax Court, District Court, and Courts of Appeals. Joining me today as co-presenters are my colleagues, Kristen Michalides, who is also a partner in our New York office, and Mei Chow, a tax controversy associate in our Chicago office. Uh, as we go along, we hope that you will ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We will make every effort to answer the questions towards the end of the webinar. If we are unable to answer your question during the presentation, we will follow up with you directly once the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credits, we will be providing an alphanumeric code at some point during the presentation. In order to receive the credits, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Today we plan to start by doing a short introduction of the existing rules for partnership audits. We will then go into a discussion of the key features of the new centralized partnership audit regime. Finally, we will cover some key considerations that taxpayers may wish to consider uh, in preparing for the new regime. Uh, over the recent years, partnerships have become an increasingly popular way to structure business arrangements. Uh, these range from uh, just general investment partnerships, which can have large numbers of members, uh, partnerships that focus on passing through particular tax attributes, such as the historic rehabilitation structure credits. Uh, they're also basically used for joint ventures between companies and typically for professional service corporations. Uh, from 2002 to 2011, the number of large partnerships with 100 or more direct or indirect partners, as well as 100 million or more in assets, more than tripled to over 10,000. That was an increase of almost two, over 250%. This significant growth in partnerships has attracted the IRS attention and made for the environment where an improved tax partnership audit regime was thought. TEFRA, the existing system, was quite burdensome for the IRS. Uh, and even after 35 years, there are certain fundamental uncertainties in implementing it. The IRS often complains that they had difficulty identifying the tax matters partner and that that would delay the completion of audits. Uh, and then the big problem for the IRS was the difficulty in passing the adjustments that were found at the partnership level through to the individual partners where the tax was collected and paid. Uh, further, there was ambiguity between which items were adjusted at the partnership level and those items which would still be adjusted at the individual partner level. Uh, the audit rates for partnerships reflect these difficulties. Uh, the IRS tells us that the audit rate for those large partnerships with more than 100 of partners and 100 million of assets was only 0.8% in 2012 compared with a 27% audit rate for large corporations. This led Congress in 2015 to repeal TEFRA and establish the new centralized partnership audit regime. Uh, since 2015, partnerships have been able to elect into the new audit structure. However, 
beginning for taxable years starting after December 31st, 2017, uh, the new regime will apply to all partnerships. The regulations for how the new regime would work were not released until January 18th of this year, and then they were promptly withdrawn uh, as part of the administration's uh, proposal to review all regulatory activities. Uh, in June, the partnership proposed regulations were reissued in substantially the same form as the January regulations. Uh, while these regulations still have to go, undergo additional hearings and the like before they become final, I would expect that they will in fact become final and that the centralized partnership regime will take effect for the coming year. Uh, turning now to what the new regime looks like, uh, under TEFRA, Certain items were determined at the partnership level and others at the partner level. May, can you tell us how this has changed under the new centralized partnership regime? Sure. Um, one of the first things to know about the centralized partnership audit regime is that it has an expansive reach so that it can cover any adjustments or assessments of items of income, gain, loss, deduction, or credit, as well as any penalties, additions to tax, additional amounts, and any partner's, partner's distributive share. These items are all going to be determined and collected at the partnership level. But what do items of income, gain, loss, deduction, or credit mean? The proposed regulations define the term pro broadly, and it can end up reaching a number of new situations. For example, now under the regulations, allocations between partners are an item and are going to be covered by the centralized partnership audit regime. Another example of an item is the existence of the partnership itself. So questions like whether the partnership is a sham or whether a partnership has been terminated will be covered by the new regime. And in broadening the definition of what counts as an item, the new regime gets rid of TEFRA's old distinction between partnership items and affected items. Now, TEFRA applied to all partnerships with more than 10 partners as well as any partnership that had a partnership or an S corporation as its partner. How does that compare to what we now have under the new centralized uh, partnership audit? Um, so it's different now. Um, some smaller partnerships can elect out of the centralized partnership audit regime if they're an eligible partnership, but election out means that they're going to instead be following the pre-TEFRA rules. Now to be an eligible partnership, the partnership needs to have 100 or fewer eligible partners. So the only partners that can be eligible partners are the ones that are individuals, C corporations, S corporations, estates of deceased partners, or eligible foreign entities, mean, meaning that they would have been a C corporation if incorporated uh, in the United States. And these partners need to stay eligible for the entire year. Further, for a partnership to be an eligible partnership, it has to furnish 100 or fewer Schedules K for the taxable year, and that number is including Schedules K-1 that have to be furnished by any partners that are S corporations. Finally, only simple partners, partnerships can elect out. Um, this means that tiered partnership structures and partnerships that have disregarded entity partners can't opt out of the centralized partnership audit regime. They're not eligible to do so. So if you have an LLC or a disregarded entity as a partner, that's going to prevent your partnership from electing out of the regime. Now, one thought is um, some smaller partnerships might want to consider how these rules about eligible partnerships might affect them, especially if they want the ability to elect out of the uh, centralized partnership audit regime. For example, in the past, it was not uncommon for a partnership to have a partnership serving as a general partner, with the other partners being limited partners. Under the centralized partnership audit regulations, though, this structure is not going to be able to elect out of the regime. So if the partnership would otherwise be eligible to elect out of the regime, the partnership might consider replacing the partnership general partner with an S corporation, ensuring that all partners can be eligible partners. And this might allow the partnership to receive similar business advantages while giving the partnership the option to elect out. If a partnership is able to elect out, 
the election out needs to be made on the partnership's timely filed return for the relevant taxable year, and this needs to happen each year. The partnership needs to provide information to the IRS in order to make this election. It needs to give the IRS the name and taxpayer identification numbers of each partner, as well as that of each person to whom an S-corporation partner is required to furnish tax statements. The partnership also needs to notify each partner of the election within 30 days of making the election. And this can be done in writing, in electronic form, or any other form, it's up to the partnership. And after the partnership elects out of the centralized partnership audit regime, the IRS will issue separate audit reports to each partner. Now once the election out is in place, the election is going to be binding on all partners, and the election can't be revoked unless the IRS consents to it. Now, the only way the election out would not be binding is if the IRS determines that the election is invalid, for example, for not meeting the eligible partnership requirements. And note that the IRS says it plans to review elections out of the regime using judicial doctrines and federal tax principles to see if two partnerships that have elected out are actually, in substance, really one bigger partnership that isn't able to elect out. Now, under TEFRA, there was a general partner that would be designated by the partnership, the Tax Matters Partner, to represent the partner during the TEFRA proceedings. However, there was also rights of other partners uh, to participate in the audit. Uh, is that still the case? No, Bill, it's not. The centralized partnership audit regime eliminates both the role of the tax matters partner and the concept of notice partners who are entitled to be informed of and participate in tax-related administrative and judicial proceedings. Instead, the new regime establishes what's referred to as the partnership representative. Each partnership that's subject to the centralized partnership audit regime must designate a partnership representative on the partnership's return for each taxable year. Designation does not carry over year to year, and it can't be changed retroactively simply by designating a new partnership representative in a later year. The partnership representative will have substantially greater powers in tax proceedings compared with TEFRA's Tax Matters Partner. The partnership representative, for example, will have the sole authority to act on behalf of the partnership and partners in tax proceedings. Unless the IRS consents otherwise, only the partnership representative may participate in any audit of a partnership. The partnership representative's actions are also binding on behalf of the partnership and all partners. This includes partners that are themselves partnerships that have elected out of the centralized partnership audit regime for their own purposes. Among the responsibilities of the partnership representative under the new regime, are the determinations regarding whether to request a modification of any imputed underpayment and whether to elect the push-out option, both of which will be discussed later in this presentation. In addition, the partnership representative will have the exclusive power to extend the statute of limitations during an audit, to protest a proposed adjustment to IRS appeals, to pursue litigation of a tax dispute, to settle a tax dispute, either with the IRS or in court, and to raise any penalty defenses on behalf of the partnership or on behalf of any of the partners. The requirement to designate a partnership representative was intended to ease some of the administrative burdens under TEFRA that the IRS faced in identifying the Tax Matters Partner and in working with both the Tax Matters Partner and the various notice partners throughout an audit, appeal, or tax dispute in court. Unlike under TEFRA, the partnership representative does not need to be a partner in the partnership. This change is likely to make it easier to find qualified and willing partnership representatives under the new regime. The change is also expected to reduce incidences of a partnership representative being disqualified for lack of proper partner status. Rather than being required to be a general partner in the partnership, the partnership representative may be any individual or entity that satisfies certain eligibility requirements that are outlined in the proposed regulations that were released in January and reintroduced in June of this year.
The first eligibility criteria is that the partnership representative must have a substantial presence in the United States. Such a presence exists if the partnership representative has a U.S. street address, a U.S. telephone number, a U.S. taxpayer identification number, and the ability to meet with the IRS in person in the United States at a reasonable place and time. Second, the representative must have the capacity to act as partnership representative. In the case of a partnership representative who is an individual, no capacity will be found to exist in the event of death, incarceration, or incapacitation. And in the case of an entity representative, no capacity to act will be found where the entity has been liquidated or dissolved. Finally, in the case of an entity partnership representative, the partnership is also required to identify an individual uh, referred to in the proposed regulations as a designated individual who herself has a substantial presence in the United States and the capacity to act as partnership representative. That individual, in the case of uh, an entity partnership representative or the individual partnership representative, uh, is going to be the person to whom the IRS looks in dealing with the management of an audit uh, and for uh, the decision-making that's necessary in order to proceed uh, on behalf of the partnership through the audit, through appeals, or through the litigation processes. Given the important role and power of the partnership representative, partnerships will need to be careful in their selection of partnership representative. They should select someone with a combination of good judgment, familiarity with the partnership's activities, and experience with the IRS that in the partnership's estimation and the partner's estimation is most appropriate. This will vary by partnership and from partner to partner. For some partnerships, the best partnership representative will be determined to be an existing partnership manager. For others, there may be a partner within the partnership who is uniquely suited to serve as the partnership representative, or a trusted advisor may be chosen. Commentators have also suggested that firms uh, will develop a cottage industry of offering partnership representative services, and many partnership rep partnerships may choose such a firm to serve as their partnership representative. Thank you, Kristen. Now, with the um, designation being made at the time that the uh, partnership is filing its return and the audit not beginning until a number of years later, I could see problems coming up and you know, circumstances having changed. Uh, May, are there any uh, tools here to enable uh, you to address that situation? Sure. Um, well, representatives can be replaced. Um, when a partnership representative is designated, that designation stays in effect until that partnership representative resigns or when the designation is revoked. Um, and for that representative to resign or be revoked, the partnership needs to give the IRS written notice. And in the case of revocation, they're going to also need to give notice to the representative. But this written notice to the IRS can only be submitted either after the partnership receives a notice of administrative proceeding or when it files an administrative adjustment request. This administrative adjustment request is a mechanism that a partnership can use to correct errors on a partnership's return for a prior year and can only be filed after receiving a notice of administrative proceeding. But you can't use the administrative adjustment request only for a designation of representative. This means that any notice of resignation or revocation of a partnership representative needs to be accompanied by some change or adjustment. The purpose of not allowing resignations or revocations before a notice of administrative proceeding is to prevent unnecessary administrative work for partnerships that will not be audited anyway. But this could lead to situations where months pass after a representative wants to leave that position, but no successor representative has been designated. Returning to the partnership representative, let's say a partnership tries to designate a partnership representative. Um, there actually might be a number of reasons why the IRS might say that the attempted representative designation is not in effect. 
First, if the partnership didn't make a valid designation on its timely filed tax return, that's not going to be in effect. Second, if the partnership does not designate a successor after the representative has made a valid resigna designation, resignation, then no designation is in effect. Third, the designated representative might lack the required substantial presence in the United States or the capacity to act. Or fourth, there might have been multiple revocations um, attempted during a 90-day period. So if the IRS identifies any of these problems, it's going to determine that the attempted designation was not effective. Now, if the IRS determines that the attempted designation is not in effect, the IRS is going to notify the partnership and give the partnership a chance to designate a successor within 30 days. Then, if the partnership still fails to designate the representative within that 30-day window, the IRS will go ahead and designate the representative itself. When the IRS has to pick a representative, there's a number of factors that it can consider. They'll think about whether there's, for example, a suitable partner in the partnership, whether or not in the reviewed year, as well as the views of the partners with the majority interest in the partnership, and along with which person has a general knowledge of tax matters and administrative operation of the partnership, whether the person is a United States person, and the type of access to books and records of the partnership that the person has. Another situation where the IRS will immediately designate a new representative itself is if there were multiple revocations going on around the same time. Okay. The audit of the partnership is in many ways going to be similar to the principles that are generally applicable to other examinations and even what was done under TEFRA. However, there will be some differences in the terminology uh, connected with it. The partnership audit will begin with the IRS sending a notice of administrative proceedings. Uh, following that, the IRS will work with the partnership representative to set up a schedule for responding to various information requests and then the partnership representative will respond. In that regard, it will be similar to uh, any other IRS audits that you have been familiar with. Now, a distinction from the TEFRA system is that under the centralized partnership audit regime, the partners are not automatically entitled to any notice of the start of the audit or of any developments that occur during the audit. Uh, this is in a clear distinction from the TEFRA rules, which did provide notice. Now, if you want such notice, you really will need to structure it into a partnership agreement or some other document uh, to provide that the partnership representative gives the such notice but the IRS is in no way affected by whether or not the other partners are notified of the uh, audit. Uh, as the audit develops, the IRS will inform the partnership representative of what transactions or issue are being considered, and eventually that will be formalized in a document called the Notice of Proposed Partnership Adjustment. Uh, the IRS has three years uh, from the time the return is filed uh, to issue a, a NOPA, but uh, that time may be extended. And I would expect that if you have a large partnership, it would be fairly typical for the IRS to seek such an extension much in the same way that they routinely seek uh, extensions of uh, the statute of limitations for large corporate audits. Uh, there is in the proposed regulations preamble a clear indication that there will be provisions for the partnership to take any proposed adjustments through the IRS administrative appeals procedure However, we do not have yet any regulations which tell us exactly how that will occur. The actual management of the audit 
and if necessary, the appeals process is going to be a major function for the partnership representative. Uh, the proposed regulations are silent on the extent to which the partnership representative will be able to delegate uh, the day-to-day -day managing of the audits to some more junior person. Uh, if you read the regulations, literally, they take the position that the IRS only has to deal with the partnership representative. I believe this was really designed to avoid the problems of the old TEFRA arrangement where multiple partners could be involved. I would think as long as the partnership representative has just a, a, you know, some delegate to respond to the IRS, uh, they will not have a problem with that, but it is possible that the person who is designated as the partnership representative may have to have frequent and regular contact with the IRS, and they certainly will have to do it if there's something begins going wrong and the IRS feels that they're not getting timely responses in that case. Uh, I think they will definitely be knocking on the door of the partnership representative. Uh, that's really the focus of making sure there's an office in the U.S. that the person's available to meet and so forth, is to ensure that the IRS has a ready point of contact. Uh, a clear difference in the NOPA from prior things is that the NOPA will include an imputed underpayment, and this is a new concept. This imputed underpayment is an additional tax liability from the proposed partnership adjustment that is to be paid, absent other elections, by the partnership rather than by any of the individual partners. This is sort of one of the main changes in the new regulations that are designed to ease the IRS's abilities to collect uh, amounts that are done, and that solves a lot of the problems that were previously there. Now, Kristen, could you explain to us how the imputed underpayment concept is intended to work? Certainly, Bill. Under the proposed regulations, the imputed underpayment is calculated using a somewhat complicated grouping and netting mechanism. Under that mechanism, adjustments are first placed into one of three basic groupings, those that allocate, reallocate items among partners, those pertaining to a partnership's credits, and finally, all remaining adjustments. There's also a fourth basic grouping that's identified in the proposed regulations covered covering creditable expenditures. However, the proposed regulations reserve on this, so for our current purposes, I think it's safe to assume that that basic grouping will not be used. Within each of the three basic groupings, then, adjustments will be placed into various subgroupings according to their character, preferences, or other restrictions. For example, ordinary and capital amounts will be separated into different subgroupings, and short-term and long-term capital amounts will be separated into different subgroupings. Although adjustments will be generally netted within a group or subgroup, they will not be adjusted or, excuse me, netted across those groups or subgroups. So adjustments that reallocate items among partners, for example, will not be netted against other adjustments facing the partnership. In addition, under the proposed regulations, any negative adjustments or those that would lower tax are generally ignored, except in the credit grouping. All positive adjustments in the reallocation grouping and all positive adjustments in the residual grouping are added together, and this figure is then multiplied by the highest income tax rate in effect for the reviewed year. The resulting number is adjusted upward or downward by any net increase or decrease in credits resulting from the partnership adjustments, and this figure is what's known as the imputed underpayment. The use of the highest tax rate in calculating the imputed underpayment is somewhat of a departure from TEFRA, which utilized the partner's own tax rates to arrive at the respective underpayment. Uh, 
Now, Kristen, if I understand you correctly, it sounds like this is going to increase the amount of tax. Yes, uh, it's certainly possible that under uh, the centralized partnership audit regime uh, in general, that the prescribed imputed underpayment calculation could overstate the amount of tax that's due by the partnership compared with what would have been due had the partners and partnership reported the adjustments properly in the first instance. However, the new regime does contain an optional mechanism uh, in order to attempt to correct for this fate. The optional mechanism is known as modification, and a partnership may request a modification of any imputed underpayment within 270 days of the mailing of the notice of proposed partnership adjustment. The partnership representative is solely responsible for determining whether to request one or more modifications, for submitting the request for modification, and for substantiating all facts that support the modification to the satisfaction of the IRS. In order to satisfy these responsibilities, the partnership representative must have access to sufficient information and documentation from the partners in order to persuade the IRS that modification is appropriate for some or all partners and for some or all imputed underpayments. The goal of the modifications, as explained in the preamble to the proposed regulations, is to enable the partnership and the IRS to determine as closely as possible the amount of tax that would have been due had the partnership and partners originally reported and paid the correct amount due in the absence of an audit. The modification provisions are complicated. Uh, there, are, as we'll discuss on the next slide, there are eight types of potential modifications that partnerships can seek, uh, and it remains to be seen how effective the modifications will actually be in practice at achieving the goal of parity with uh, adjustments on the partner level as opposed to on the partnership level via the imputed underpayment. As I mentioned, uh, the proposed regulations identify eight types of modifications. A partnership may request modification of an imputed underpayment based on an amended return filed by a reviewed year partner that takes into account a partnership adjustment. Second, the partnership may request a modification with respect to adjustments that are allocable to tax-exempt partners and thus should not be included within the calculation of imputed underpayments for the partnership. Third, a modification may be requested based on a reduction of tax below the highest applicable rate for capital gains or qualified dividends, for example, of a C corporation or individual partner. Fourth, a modification may be requested to remove certain passive losses of publicly traded partnerships from the imputed underpayment calculation. Fifth, a modification may be requested to reflect adjustments to the number and composition of imputed underpayments in circumstances where a specific rather than a general imputed underpayment may be more appropriate. For example, this would uh, be reasonable in the case of uh, transactions involving only certain partners of the partnership, uh, where those transactions were the target of the IRS's proposed adjustments. Sixth, uh, modification may be requested based on adjustment for partners that are mutual funds or REITs. Seventh, modifications may be requested based on adjustments to reflect partner closing agreements. And finally, there's a section in the proposed regulations that permits other modifications uh, within the IRS's discretion. The proposed regulations address the requirements for computing each of these modifications, and the IRS has the discretion to reject any request for proposed modifications. Uh, so as I mentioned, it remains to be seen the effectiveness of the modification provisions at correcting disparities for um, partners in the centralized partnership audit regime. Now, Kristen, as I understand what you've just told us, the uh, adjustments, while they're modified by the various adjustments, they still would be paid by the partnership in the year in which the audit is finished. The partnership may have changed its uh, composition over the period. And in that time, 
you know, the, the people then that might bear the economic cost of the tax could be different. Uh, May, is there any technique that could be used to cover that? Uh, yes, um, there's a mechanism to address that situation. Um, and it's called the push at election. So there, uh, instead of the default rule, where the adjustment year partners pay the tax, the partnership can instead elect the push out rule. Under the push out election, uh, all partners from the reviewed year will pay the tax underpayment. The partnership can push out one or more of the imputed underpayments identified in the final partnership adjustment to the reviewed year partners. To put the push out into effect, the partnership needs to furnish to partners a statement of each partner's share of the adjustment. The election will then bind all the reviewed year partners. The reviewed year partners will then be liable for any tax, penalties, and additions to tax in accordance with their respective shares of the total adjustment. The reviewed year partners will need to report and pay any amounts owed on the returns for the year when the partnership notified them of their shares of the adjustment. Now, I mentioned that partnerships can make the election for one or more imputed underpayments identified in the final partnership adjustment. For example, where the final partnership adjustment includes one general imputed underpayment and one or more specific underpayments attributable to specific adjustments, the partnership might choose to push out the specific underpayments to the partners um, that are directly implicated. If the push-out election is made, the partners need to also pay any tax deficiencies for all years between the reviewed year and the adjustment year. The interest rate under the push-out election is the federal short-term rate plus 5%, while the interest rate without the push-out election is the federal short-term rate plus 3%. So when deciding whether to make the push-out election, one thing to consider is the difference in the interest charge between the push-out election and not making the push-out election which is lower by two percentage points. But even without the push-out election, current partners might still have a way to get reviewed year partners to recover the cost of imputed underpayments. That would depend on what the agreements with the departing partners have to say. Whatever the contract says, though, be prepared for any challenges with, um, when it comes to collecting from your own departing partners. And now, there are some requirements for this push-out election to be valid. Uh, in order to make the election, the partnership needs to make the push-out election within 45 days from when the final partnership adjustment is mailed. Then the partnership will need to do the actual push-out within the 60 days after the final partnership adjustment is finally determined, meaning when the deadline to file a petition has expired or if the partnership seeks judicial review, the date when the court's decision becomes final. The partnership representative then needs to provide the IRS and each reviewed year partner with a statement saying what each partner's respective share of the adjustment is. If the partnership seeks judicial review of the adjustment, that could cause years to elapse between when the push-out election occurs and when the statement is provided to each partner. Finally, note that the push-out election can be revoked only with the consent of the IRS. You might find the IRS willing to consent to the revocation of a push-out election, though, since it reduces the administrative burden on their end to collect through the partnership. One example of a situation where the partnership might want to revoke the election is if it sought judicial review. A partnership seeking judicial review still has to meet the 45-day election deadline. Then, if it finds out that the adjustment has been reduced through judicial review, it might decide that it does not need to push out the underpayment after all. Uh, okay, Kristen, uh, Mays indicated that there is the potential for judicial review. How is that different under the new centralized uh, audit regime as compared to TEFRA? Well, broadly, the judicial review framework under the new regime is consistent with TEFRA. However, there are three significant changes that I think are worth noting. The first has to do with who may seek uh, petition for readjustment related to a partnership adjustment. Under TEFRA, the tax matters partner had 90 days to file a petition for readjustment, 
And after that, if it had chosen not to do so, any notice partner had 60 days uh, within which to file a petition for readjustment on its own. Under the new regime, only the partnership via the partnership representative is entitled to file a petition for readjustment. Because the partnership representative is solely responsible under the proposed regulations for determining whether or not to pursue litigation regarding a proposed adjustment, this forecloses any partners from disagreeing with the partnership representative's determination and pursuing litigation uh, on their own. The second significant change under the uh, centralized partnership audit regime with respect to judicial review has to do with the financial barrier to entry to um, refund suits. Under TEFRA, a partner needed only to deposit with the IRS its proportionate share of any adjustments set forth in the final partnership adjustment before suing for a refund. Under the new regime, however, the partnership must deposit the full amount of the imputed underpayment uh, in order to be eligible for uh, the refund for us. This higher financial barrier to entry to the U.S. Court of Federal Claims and U.S. District Court for refund suits on behalf of the partnership is it may lead to additional litigation related to partnership issues within the U.S. tax court, which does not have a payment requirement before seeking entry. Uh, however, the requirement of full payment by the partnership is completely consistent with the partnership's obligation under the new regime to pay the full amount of the imputed underpayment uh, once it's finally determined. And finally, uh, the last significant change related to uh, the judicial framework under the new regime as compared with TEFRA has to do with raising penalty defenses. Under TEFRA, partner level penalty defenses were raised by partners in partner level proceedings that were instigated following the completion of partnership level proceedings. Under the new regime, however, uh, there's only a single proceeding dealing with um, issues affecting the partnership, including any penalties applied to the partnership and penalties applied to the various partners. So all penalty defenses must be raised at the partnership level, and the partnership representative is responsible for making the determination as to whether or not to raise a penalty defense, not only on behalf of the partnership, but also on behalf of any individual partner within that partnership. So for example, the partnership representative would be responsible for raising a reasonable cause defense to accuracy related penalties under section 6662 on behalf of any partner within the partnership. Um, in order to do this effectively and make the determination as to whether pursuing a penalty defense is appropriate and how to plead it and uh, defend the penalty defense at litigation, the partnership representative must have access to sufficient information and documentation from the various partners in order to make uh, the presentation of that penalty defense effectively. Okay, the, we've covered a lot here. I think there's a few important things to take away. The obvious one is I would expect more audits of partnerships in general. I mean, if the whole purpose of having a new regime was to address additional audit potentials, I would expect that the IRS will follow that lead and actually conduct more audits. Uh, particularly large partnerships, I think, are going to have a higher frequency of audits because it's now a much easier system for the IRS to use to actually uh, deal with those audits. However, while a big focus of these new rules was on the large partnerships, you shouldn't ignore the fact that they apply to all partnerships, including existing partnerships. And this can include you know, things like a simple joint venture that your company might have with another company. And they will be covered by these rules unless there is a, an affirmative election out each of the years. And in that regard, you are limited to having a simple partnership structure, which can be a problem for many 
many business arrangements now. I mean, May mentioned the one where a general partner was in fact itself a partnership. Another fairly common item is that uh, joint ventures are often held through a disregarded entity, which under the current proposed regs would disqualify you from electing out. Now that is one aspect of the proposed regs that has received a lot of criticism and uh, there's some indication the IRS may eliminate that restriction since it doesn't really impede their ability to make collections. Uh, you're going to want to keep in mind that there's now a number of key dates that you previously didn't need to pay the same degree of attention to. Uh, the designation of the partnership representative and the election out of the centralized partnership regime both need to be made by the return filing date, so you want to keep that in mind. If you do elect out, you're going to have to provide information to the partners about the election out within 30 days. You're going to want to keep track of that. Uh, you're going to want to be watching three years from the filing of the return because that will be the period in which uh, the IRS has to propose an adjustment absent an extension that's been granted. And then once there is a, a NOPA being issued, you've got that 270-day period to file any adjustment. And you know, that could well require a lot of information and therefore you know, you're going to need to pay attention to that. If it gets to the notice of final partnership adjustment, uh, the decision about whether or not you want to push out the adjustment has to be made within 45 days, so that, that's a critical one. And then if you're going to seek judicial review, you need to do that within the 90 days. Uh, the, uh, and then you get the, the irony that May had pointed out. If you have elected out and you also decided to pursue a judicial remedy, there may be a long period between the time that you actually elected to push out the adjustment and the time when you will actually have to do so. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of questions that the partnership is going to have to consider. Uh, they're going to want to think about whether they want to elect out of the regime, who they want to choose as the partnership representative, and who has the power to replace the partnership representative. Uh, under the regulations, any general partner can revoke that. I would suspect that a lot of partnership agreements will want to limit that in some way. Uh, you're going to want to think about, if, you're, if you haven't had to deal with audits before, uh, you may want to think about what kind of infrastructure you need to be able to timely respond to IRS requests if they come. Uh, as we've noted several times, there's no provision in the statute for keeping the other partners advised about developments. Uh, again, that is something you may want to work into the partnership agreement uh, to provide some periods of notice or consultation by the other partners with the partnership representative. Uh, keep in mind, though, even if that is a contractual provisions of the partnership agreement, uh, as far as the IRS is concerned, they deal with the partnership representative, and whatever the partnership representative does is binding on all of the partners. Uh, so anyway, I would suggest at this point in time, uh, you may well want to look at your partnership agreements, decide whether they're going to be adequate to deal with this new environment, uh, because I do think it is a very different world in terms of partnership audits, which we are going into. Now, May, have we had any questions during uh, the period that we yeah. can answer? Yeah, I received um, two questions, and um, I can answer both. Uh, the first question asks, um, it relates to the uh, election out of the regime altogether um, and whether or not a partnership could, would be an eligible partnership to elect out. So as, as you recall, um, I had mentioned earlier that a smaller partnership 
um, could elect out if it has 100 or fewer uh, eligible partners, and it also needs to issue 100 or fewer uh, Schedule K, Schedules K, and that includes uh, Schedules K-1 um, that are uh, issued from a, an S corporation. So uh, the question is, if a Schedule K-1 that is um, coming out of an S corporation uh, is only for, so if the person who is receiving that Schedule K-1 is only receiving um, guaranteed payment and no other um, income that's attributable to the partnership, uh, whether that Schedule K-1 would be included in the count of uh, 100, uh, it appears under the regulations it would be um, under the language of the regulations. And the reasoning for it, um, for the election out is to find uh, certain smaller partnerships where the administrative burden on the IRS would not be so great. So if you still, if you think about it, the person who's receiving that Schedule K-1, the IRS would still need to um, verify the situation of that person. So it, um, even if they're not um, receiving any other income besides guaranteed payment, the IRS would still have to um, try to verify that. So it would still be counted in um, the total of 100. Um, the second question is, um, it relates to the push-out election. So as you recall, I mentioned earlier, um, reviewed years under the push-out election, the reviewed year partners will pay instead of having the current year partners pay. And this question asks about a tiered partnership structure. So imagine if um, partnership one is owned by partnership two, and then that's also, and then partnership two is owned by C Corp. So it's like this, this chain of, um, this chain structure. Um, the question asks if that bottom partnership chooses to push out an adjustment to the, to the partnership two, so the middle partnership, whether that partnership two can further push out to the um, C corporation that owns partnership two, or whether there's only one level of push out. So the uh, reproposed regulations, as, as reproposed on um, last month, uh, it explicitly reserves the issue of tiered push outs. Um, so that tiered push out is you know, a tier partnership where the push out goes not only to the first layer of partners, but only but beyond that first layer of partners out. Um, the the regulations don't will not say anything about it. It's um, they're just going to reserve that issue for now. And part of the reason why they're still um, reserving it is because the legislative history behind whether um, tiered pushouts can occur is ambiguous. Um, the Joint Committee of Taxation uh, report on the bipartisan budget act that. So the, the statute at issue, uh, the Joint Committee of Taxation report said that adjustments could only be pushed out once. So that's one data point um, saying that adjustments should only be able to put, be pushed out once. But Congress later introduced a technical corrections legislation in 2016 that would have provided that elections could be pushed out to ultimate investors. So that would allow you to do the tiered push out um, throughout the chain. But this legislation was not passed and has not yet been reintroduced for 2017. So that's, that's your second data point. Um, the second data point of attempted legislation to allow for that tiered push out. So we have one data point saying that with the original uh, statute, you could not do, uh, you could only do one level of, put, of, of push out, but um, then you have another data point saying that you, uh, that suggests that Congress wanted people to be able to do a tiered push out. So we have two data points, but none of them tell us um, exactly what you need to do, and the re regulations explicitly reserve that issue, so they won't, they won't um, address that topic. And you can obviously see that the IRS would have some reluctance to allow the push-out, because that gets them back to the difficulties of actually collecting uh, the tax that's due. I mean, if you, have, you, know, if you imagine a partnership that has you know, five or six tiers, they actually have to track all of that back to the ultimate person to you know, send the bill to and assess, it can become quite difficult. And I think the IRS hopes that they can avoid that in as many cases as possible. The, the election out is designed to give the IRS a, a better information to simplify the collection compared to the old TEFRA rules, but it's still, if it gets pushed out, it will obviously be more difficult to actually collect from the individual people. Uh, and you, you quickly get down to the, 
if you split the adjustment a thousand times, it becomes a relatively small amount. So even, you know, just sending out notices and so on at some point becomes non-productive for the IRS. Okay, with that, we really appreciate all of your taking time out of your summer to uh, listen to it. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to send any of us uh, an email. Uh, within the next couple of days, we will be putting the slides and the presentation up on our website. So if you are, uh, if you, you know, feel you would like to see the slides afterwards, you will be able to get them. It will take a couple of days to get them up there, but they, they will be available shortly. Thank you, and I guess that's all for today.